So welcome everybody to Net Capital's live Q&A with Snapshift. I'd like to welcome Thor, the CEO. Uh, Thor, thanks for being here. Oh, always a pleasure, Rob. It's great to be here and talk to everybody. Yeah, and your beard's looking great today. Excited, uh, <laughs> excited to chat. Um, yes. So, and thanks to all the attendees who are watching either live or via recording. Uh, if you're watching live, there's a Q&A function at the bot bottom of your Zoom screen. If anyone has questions throughout the interview, you're welcome to put them in there, and I'll and I'll throw them in across. Uh, if you're watching this as a recording and you have additional questions for Thor, you can. Uh, post a question on Snapshift's discussion board on the Net Capital site, and he'll get right back to you. Uh, a link to that, uh, a link to that page will be in the description of this video in the recording, uh, and I will put it in the chat uh, here shortly uh, for those watching live. Um, so again, Thor, thanks for being here. We're excited to kind of dig into Snapshift. Heck yeah! I know uh, with the offering page, I'd love to. You can only get so much uh, when you when you see the page. So I'm I'm excited to kind of elaborate on things. Exactly. So just to set the stage and to kick us off, you want to just give us a, a brief overview, of kind of what is Snapshift and what do you do? Yeah. So Snapshift is a uh, staffing as a service software and mobile app. Uh, we connect businesses with fully vetted and experienced staff on demand. Uh, really, it's about combining the best attributes of the gig economy. Uh, and HR tech to unite available workers to short-term work opportunities. Um, we're actually headquartered in the Midwest in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, we've been in business as far as um, uh, kicking off the business for about four years. We officially launched Snapshift out of beta in January of 2018. So we've got a couple years under our belt um, and maybe what, nine months of this, right? But uh, you know, we've always had a focus early on on food, uh, food service, hospitality, restaurants, bars, that sort of thing uh, when we launched. And, and really, uh, we remain committed to that industry. Uh, and I'll get into why. But, uh, you know, over the last seven or eight months, we've really focused on extending our reach into some tertiary sectors that play nice, you know, with the food and beverage and hospitality space. And that's food manufacturing, packaging, dietary within healthcare and even on, on the grocery side of things. So you think food supply chain, and that's something that we can plug in, and we're already seeing that we can be successful in that. Um, if it's okay, Rob, I've got a few stats uh, I can add. Um, you know, basically, uh, we've got 450 plus unique locations on the platform right now. We're approaching 40,000 workers that have signed up. Um, you know, we, uh, our target, our largest base is actually Indianapolis, is where we launched. Uh, and then we've also got uh, substantial uh, pools in Chicagoland, Denver, Nashville, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and we actually had our sights set on, on kicking things off in Tampa and Milwaukee and Philadelphia, which are some areas that we're seeing organic demand uh, from both businesses and workers. Uh, we actually even had sit downs with the, uh, Denver, uh, the um, Detroit mayor's office, uh, as well as the mayor of Miami-Dade. So you've got, you know, local governments taking the labor initiative or the upskilling, you know, gig segment, getting people to generate income, they're taking it seriously and they're tapping us to, to see if there's something that makes sense there. Um, coming into 2020, we'd actually almost doubled in size last year. We grew 94%. Uh, we kicked off 2020 growing 240% in Q1, uh, which that's, that's a hell of a start. And then of course, COVID kind of took the wind out of our sails and, you know, predominantly, uh, you know, everyone else in the country, save a few sectors. Um, but since the Q2, um, basically lockdown, we uh, just got our numbers in for Q3. We're up, um, what was the number? It was 570% uh, growth over Q2. Um, obviously coming from a smaller number, but still uh, very indicative. Uh, and we saw that stack, right? So, you know, first month of the quarter to the last month of the quarter, it increased substantially. And, and we've actually got commitments looking at our pipeline now and commitments with existing customers. We're actually um, forecasting something pretty substantial, uh, approaching 700% in Q4. So we're really excited because what that does is that gets us back to where we were forecasting for 2020 and sets the stage for big things in uh, the new year. Um, to talk about capital on the capital side of things, Rob, you know, uh, and it shows on our page, we're backed by 500 startups. 
uh, Generator, Alumni Ventures, Gravity Ventures, Atlan Ventures, and several angels uh, that are pretty phenomenal. Uh, we had raised 700000 uh, in, in seed capital. And most recently, kicking off the uh, net capital offering, we also got a commitment from SAS Growth Ventures, uh, which will bring our total raise uh, approaching 1.1 million. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited. Um, and we've been able to do that in this climate, in the Midwest, and, and with such a lean team. So there you have it. That's fantastic. That, thanks for that overview. Um, exciting. Uh, you know, all of it sounds really exciting, especially that you guys are bouncing back uh, amidst all the, the pandemic craziness. So that's really exciting. Um, I want to dig into all of the everything you just talked about. Um, before we dive into the product and all that stuff, um, you know, I always like to start these talking about the team. So can you give me an overview of kind of the team you put together at Snapshift? You know, what are your backgrounds and why, you know, why are you guys going to, are you guys going to be uniquely successful? Yeah. So as a team, we've got strong backgrounds and on the HR staffing and recruiting side of things. I mean, uh, me personally, 13 years specifically in recruiting. Uh, most recently I was part of the, uh, a company down in Southwest Florida in the freight forwarding 3PL logistics side of things. Uh, we grew from uh, 24 million to over 108 million in uh, annual recurring revenue with the highest uh, um, net margins uh, in the industry at the time. Uh, but, you know, around 13, towards the end of 13, I got antsy. Uh, I decided to branch out and really establish um, my own recruiting agency. Uh, still focusing in that space because I had built such a substantial following and, and network, uh, but I was working with Matson, uh, which is a $2 billion outfit, um, legit, uh, B2B uh, logistics out of Chicago, sorry. They're awesome guys. Uh, LDI out of New York, and of course, still started, you know, kept working with that, my former employer, um, and kind of got triggered uh, by the birth of uh, my firstborn, Haley, who, who just celebrated her birthday yesterday. Uh, but that really had me saying, what's my legacy? What do I want to be doing, uh, you know, as a father? And so that's, that was the impetus that we needed to, uh, or that I personally needed to relocate, uproot from Southwest Florida, move to Indianapolis, and uh, really start putting, uh, testing our hypotheses and building the Snapchat product. Uh, my co-founder um, is Stephanie Corliss. She's phenomenal. Uh, she's our COO. Uh, she's a real dynamo on uh, ops, uh, 20 years in, in ops and finance and accounting, uh, HR experience, uh, nonprofit side of things, Fortune 500 side of things. You know, she was with Novellus and Source Interlink, um, and, but she really actually drives our customer success, right? So I'm out there beating the drum and, and making noise. Um, she's the reason that they're sticking around. So they've actually got, uh, or we've actually got 97% retention on the customer side of things. And um, we have a net promoter score of 81.9, which I'm told is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's all I got to give her the credit for that. On the technology front, uh, you know, we were very lucky to have Tony join us as our CTO uh, back in the summer of 17. Uh, we were actually introduced over lunch by my cousin, who's a part of a, another hot startup here in Indianapolis. Uh, but after lunch, Tony was, was adamant about bringing his talents uh, which stems from desktop and mobile uh, and embedded software and, and bringing that to Snapship. And, uh, you know, his background, you know, leading uh, technology for Cummins, which is uh, the largest engine manufacturer, diesel, um, you know, that's based here in Indiana. But they, uh, he uh, led 300 people on his team. Um, and it was all about HRMS, uh, payroll systems, processes. So uh, he really laid the foundation for, um, our tech stack is, is what it is today. Um, you asked about uh, why we're well positioned. So uh, we're, I think we're well positioned uh, to put a dent in the temporary staffing game because at the end of the day, that's who we're going after is, is the temp agencies. Uh, it's primarily due to the historic staffing and retention benchmarks that the sectors that, that we're in, that we operate in, um, they've got these historic marks that are ridiculous, um, uh, which are, they, they hold true whether you're in uh, good times or economic downturns, um, and which we're seeing firsthand right now. So the problems with staffing have actually been uh, ex exacerbated during COVID. Um, let me see here, there, I had a stat. All right, good, we're tracking ahead actually uh, of last year. So we came in at 94% fulfillment last year. Uh, we're at over 95% approaching 96% here in 2020. 
Um, really, it's about eliminating the friction, uh, you know, uh, and bias inherent in staffing, generating positive outcomes, and um, again, going after the temp staffing agencies uh, in the U.S. at the $140 billion uh, behemoth, and uh, that's, that's who we're, we're beating. They're dinosaurs in every sense, and they simply haven't been able to compete with us on a fulfillment standpoint. And so as we scale, watch what happens with that. Exciting stuff. And so um, one that, kind of real s small side question, I'm not particularly familiar with it. Um, you mentioned a, a net promoter score. Um, can you give people a sense of what that is? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, any of these scores and rankings, I, you know, I always take with a grain of salt, but at the end of the day, really the net promoter score, MPS, um, it, it's customer sentiment. And so you can really break it down and say, um, simple question. Uh, would you use our product? Um, you know, yes, no, maybe, right? Um, I'm trying to think of the other question. We really have five questions that we engage them with. Um, could you live without our product? Um, yes, absolutely not. Absolutely, yes, I could. And you, you grade that, right, on a scale of one to 10. And there's, there's a, a rubric that you can Google. Um, but ultimately, it came down to 81.9, which I, at, at first I'm like, oh, that's, you know, that's a C minus, right? And then, you know, I, I started, you know, learning that, no, that's pretty darn good that really anything above, I think, 50, 60 is, is, is exceptional. And so again, you know, I think it's indicative of, of, of the impact that we're having on the customers um, because again, labor staffing, you know, labor retention uh, is just a nightmare. And so I think any, any positive movement on that regard, you know, you become, um, you know, something that they can't live without. Does that make sense? I'd say Google it. I don't, I don't want to quote the, uh, the, uh, the actual formula, but. No problem. No, but that makes a lot of sense. And that's good to know, right? It's it basically a score of how, how hard you are to live without. Um, but getting back on track a little bit, wanted to talk about the problem. So, you know, I think some people might be familiar with what a temp agency is. I mean, I, you know, most of us at one time in our lives, uh, back in the, in the time before, uh, you know, went to restaurants and, and went to hotels and things like that. And, and we probably interact with a lot of people who, um, you know, employees of businesses that would use your service or use temp agencies. But can you talk to us just a little bit about like, uh, what's the problem in those industries in, in finding part-time work, things like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the short of it is staffing is a pain in the ass. Um, and I'll break into the details of why it's so bad in, in food manufacturing, food and beverage and hospitality. Uh, but there's a true disconnect between businesses that are in desperate need of quality, qualified talent that they can rely on and the qualified professionals that are potentially looking for, you know, laboring, uh, leveraging their, uh, their skill set uh, in frictionless ways. Uh, so the real problem here is how the businesses are attempting to tackle labor shortages in the first place. They rely on job boards. Uh, you mentioned temp agencies, right? That's kind of a last resort. Um, many of them turn to Craigslist and Facebook and truthfully hanging signs in the window. Like that's still a, a real legitimate thing that they, uh, it's illegitimate, but it, they still attempt it. Um, you know, and uh, even pre-COVID, um, there were tens of millions of shifts that were going uncovered simply because uh, they continue to address staffing in this manner. It's very inefficient. It costs money. Uh, it's staggering really. Um, just last year was over 105 billion that was lost due to turnover and being understaffed just in food and beverage, hospitality and food manufacturing. Um, so this is driven uh, by the way, the latest stimulus uh, bill, uh, has 120 billion set up that they want to set aside for the restaurants act. It's needed. You know, they got the short end of the stick, you know, with these mandates the last six, seven months. But you think about that, if they had that 105 billion in their coffers, maybe they wouldn't need 120 billion today. So that's what we want to try and help make that not a thing in the future. Uh, but okay. Looking at the stats, you've got record high turnover, uh, 70 to 150% in you know, many cases. You've got record low retention. Uh, workers, uh, employees are lasting less than two months on the job. Managers, you know, are actually only between four and six months on the job because it's simply just a, the pressures of the job. Uh, and it takes a month to replace a single employee on average. So all that stacks up, you know, with the, the actual cost of replacement. 
um, to produce that, that $105 billion number uh, that I shared from 2019. That's great. And so, you know, it sounds like you're tackling a really large problem. Talk to us about what the, what, what is Snapshift itself, right? What's the actual solution? What do you guys do? So uh, the, the short of it is we've got uh, a pool of workers and we're connecting them based on their skill sets to uh, open job opportunities on a short-term basis without job applications, without going through drug testing or any other HR, you know, funnel. So we're connecting workers to jobs and stripping the whole process of any bias or discrimination. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I think that that's, that's just been something that's been a part of it, you know, and we're seeing it right now, right. With, you know, black lives matter and it's uncovering, not just, it just, it's uncovering a lot of deficiencies. Um, and, but it's not just in this industry, it's, it's specifically across the board, uh, um, you know, that bias and discrimination are really ruining the process and you're missing out on a lot of potentially diamonds in the rough or just really great people um, due to preconceived or, you know, inherent bias. So we connect workers to jobs and we do it painlessly. We do all the, we handle it all. You just simply tell us what you need. And so if I'm a business, what, what do I need to do to get on the platform? What's my customer journey like as the business? If I'm a restaurant owner, let's say, or a, or a hotel owner. Yeah, you simply, uh, you can go to our uh, website and, and create an account um, directly there, or you can download the app for free uh, in either of the app stores. Uh, so Android, iOS, um, it's free to create an account. It takes maybe a total of 90 seconds you know, we collect some information from you uh, or from the, the business, the prospective business. And once they enter um, location that they need help, uh, enter payment information, they can be off of the races. Uh, our record actually, and, and I hate, I never lead with this on any sales calls, but our record is 18 minutes from a first time customer posting an open job opportunity at 8 p.m. on a Friday night. Uh, it was a, a whiskey bar that needed a, a mixologist heavy on the, you know, bourbon knowledge, right? 18 minutes, that person's clocking in. And, you know, that, that is a, that is a, something that could be normal. Uh, we don't, again, we don't strive to do things in minutes. We like to make sure that it's, you know, let the system really proliferate uh, the available workers and, and, you know, then, um, but anyway, it's, it's phenomenal, right? 18 minutes. It's great. Um, and, and so uh, that was a quick, a quick um, injection of um, dopamine for that for that new business. That probably worked well, and I think you mentioned it at the, in the introduction. But do you have a sense of what your um, retention rate is for new businesses? I imagine it's quite high, especially when they get um, staffed that quickly. That probably helps your retention. Yeah, you know, our first year we we didn't know what we were doing. You know, and that I think most startups kind of fumble through. You know, you have your hypotheses, you prove them out. So we look at 18 as our learning year, but really uh, since the beginning of 2019, we have a 97% retention uh, of our customers. And uh, we've been in touch with all of them during this debacle with COVID. And thus far, only two have permanently closed up their doors that they're not coming back. And I think that says a lot about, okay, You've got, you've got different calibers of business operators, business owners. And so those that are using SnapShift, it stands to reason that they're operationally more sound than their competitors. So for us to only see a handful, right, um, you know, close up shop, it's sad. You know, one of them in particular, I, I, I personally, you know, brought on board and, and it's sad to see that happen. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you keep delivering, they will stick around. And so execution is everything. One cool stat, Rob, that, that um, has held true since really since our first year uh, is once a business posts their third shift and it's covered, meaning that it was worked, they're guaranteed to do a fourth. So our whole, our whole journey, right? Our whole job of moving, moving a customer from, you know, converting them to a, you know, getting the credit card on file and the payment on file and then posting that first shift successfully, second shift, third shift, it's all designed to get them to that third shift. 
and um, because we know we're going to get there for and it becomes the Pepsi challenge. You know, we have a 90, what is it? 95, 96% fulfillment rate. Um, let's go bring on any staffing agency, any firm, any gig platform, and let's do the Pepsi challenge. And I'm not saying we're going to win out every single time. You know, every market's a little bit different. Every sector is a little bit different, but um, some, we're doing something right to be 3X uh, consistently uh, for the last two and a half years. Yeah, that's super exciting. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side of the marketplace, talk to me about the experience of the workers. You know, how, how do you sign up? How do you prove, you know, you, you talked about verified trusted. How do you prove to Snapshift that you're a good worker? And, you know, how do you get paid? Yeah, so the, the really good questions. Um, you know, ultimately, the, so the process for, the, for any worker, uh, we do the most thorough screening process. So we control the, the gate, right, to, to be on the Snapshift platform. Uh, so we do, uh, you know, seven-year criminal background check, I-9 verification, sex offender registry, um, social security trace. Uh, we collect industry references. We collect industry certifications. Uh, and once all that's done, um, you're activated. But then you're bound by our terms of use, which are very clear. Uh, but then also our community guidelines, which are at the end of the day, uh, be a good human, right? Be a professional. If you claim a job, go work that job, you know, and that's the beauty of, of a platform like ours. It's not permanent. So if it's a crappy job, well, do a good job, you know, uh, be a professional about it. You're going to get paid and don't do that job again. You don't have to tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it's, you can try so many different opportunities, so many different roles. Um, the really the, the main thing that we're very strict upon is no call, no shows. If a, so if you've got a contract worker that commits to a job and they don't show, they're done. They're blacklisted or what, what we call DNR'd from our platform. Um, and uh, pending any reviews, right, from, from our management team, uh, you, you just cut off your nose to spite your face or you just hindered your ability to gain any sort of work opportunities with hundreds and hundreds of you know, different businesses. Excuse me. Well, I'm sure that I'm sure that helps with the credibility because the, your employees, employers know that you're gonna, they're gonna show up. For sure. Uh, and if I may, I, I know, um, uh, you know, really, that, that's kind of part of why we're different, right? You know, so when you look at a temp staffing agency or any gig platform that's operating like a temp agency, they're polling all comers. So that means anybody can sign up to be a worker. Doesn't, you know, and I'm not saying that there's not some good platforms out there, but specifically temp agencies have a 34% fulfillment rate. The reason is they're grabbing anybody. They're, you know, brush your teeth, comb your hair, and here's where you need to show up. And so 34% of the time they show up and get the job done. And the workers on our platform are actually from the industry. So they're executive chefs, they're restaurateurs uh, and, and owners that are getting back behind the bar, getting, you know, getting back on the grill. Uh, they're, you know, these chefs are washing dishes. These dishwashers are busting tables. These servers are, you know, being busters. It's like, you know, this nice, uh, nice um, uh, ecosystem where, you know, if, if you have a baseline skill set, you're able to parlay that. Um, but you're coming from the industry. That's, that's the point. Uh, and so we have a higher caliber of worker because of that. That actually, that brings up a, an interesting question. So are your, are the people, are the kind of employees or the workers on your platform, are they someone like maybe an, uh, an Uber driver that's spending um, all of their time picking up temp work? Are they someone who has a full-time job and they're just running some extra hours? Um, is this people who don't have a full-time job and just use this to, to pay some bills as they you know, do something else or they're only work, they're only uh, working part-time kind of what's that, what does that look like? It's all the above. So each uh, example that you just laid out, we have a case study, um, you know, so his, you know, typically again, to be on the platform, we have to be able to verify your industry references. So uh, most of these people are putting their existing employer. So one stat uh, about the industry is that two thirds are already juggling multiple employers and that's to get the hours they need. 
So there's a nightmare wrapped in that because now you're negotiating your schedule with two entities. So logistics are tough. If you've got kids and you're dealing with school or, you know, um, you know, um, e-learning or whatever it may be, like that's a nightmare. And, and someone always suffers. One, one of the managers or, or you yourself as a worker. Uh, so what, we'll, what we see is these people will jump on the platform and use us as that supplemental, right? So if they're getting 30 hours over here at their main employer, they'll supplement with us and get 10, 15, 20 hours. Um, but then we have some that are outright, uh, you know, doing, you know, 10, 15 shifts a week. Um, you know, we, we monitor that because there's certain rules in play with contractors. So, you know, there's certain hours limitations that, uh, you know, that uh, we have in place, but you know, th these are some hustlers and the beauty thing, the beautiful thing is you can do uh, back to back to back to back, <laughs> you know, you can, you can pull a, an all nighter and, and work a third shift at a, you know, a processing facility, go and serve breakfast you know, maybe take a quick nap and then get primed for dinner and then go to a nightclub and, and bounce. Like you, you can do these back. There's no limitations uh, because they're independent. And then we see, we see teachers, we see there's firemen, there's, there's cops, uh, you know, so any, you think anybody that moonlights and has that skill set. So I bartended in college. And if you can verify that and you have your liquor license, great. There's no reason that you can't bartend on Snapchat. That's great. Um, and so, you know, zooming out a little bit, I think you mentioned this when we were talking about the, the temp agencies, but talk about the market for Snapshift. How big is it? You know, how big could this get? Yeah, so we look at our total available market, you know, 18 billion, you know, and, and that we're looking at that specifically from our ideal uh, uh, customer persona, right? It's not we're not sitting there trying to say that we're going to, we're going to staff every McDonald's and we're going to do subway like that. We're just not, we know that, that, that we're looking at about 140 to 170,000 uh, ideal customer personas in the U S and that's out of a million bars and restaurants and, and several hundred thousand other different, you know, operations that we could use. So looking at that, it's, it's an $18 billion market. Um, and that'll continue to change, right? We, we keep finding things that we're really good at where you can, you can actually leverage, whether it's leveraging the worker pool from restaurants to, to meat packing facilities, whether it's leveraging, you know, into healthcare, whether, you know, so the, it's really limitless, but in terms of our distinct focus right now, um, it, it's a very sizable uh, opportunity for us. And it's fragmented all to hell. Yeah, and so when you talk about uh, you know, it's, uh, that's a huge market. We you, you talked about being in um, Indianapolis and in a couple other cities. So what's the plan? Kind of what market do you do you tack? Do you think of it as I'm tackling markets by city, or do you think of it just you can download the app anywhere and whoever wants to use it can use it? We used to think that yeah, we used to think of like early on like we didn't know we had a little bit of lightning in a bottle. You know, we a simple Facebook post and all of a sudden. You know, we had people in Hawaii and um, just every single state, um, something like 180 cities were downloading the app. And I'm like, well, crap, we've got to be very specific uh, because, you know, we can't have two workers in New York and consider New York to be a, a live market. Um, so we were very uh, conscientious to get to a certain point. So, for example, in Indianapolis, you've got... Um, 84, 85,000 workers in this space. So for us, it wasn't about getting 84,000 workers. It's about getting that top five to 10% that are reliable, accountable, and can do repeatable business on your platform. And, and so that we have that same approach, whether it's Chicago, which is four times bigger than Indy, and you know, much larger in terms of you know, Chicago land or Denver, um, to give you an example about just, so it's kind of the chicken and the egg scenario. And we know for us having the business first, we can scale the hell out of the workers quickly. Uh, that's never a problem. So we have the largest catering operation in the state of Colorado and, uh, we weren't in Colorado at the time, but we decided to treat it as a test launch. And in three weeks we had 3000 workers in Denver. And so it's like, okay, uh, all it takes is really you dangle that carrot and you do it appropriately. You can get the workers all day, but the businesses need to trust you. 
You need to be, um, you know, have that credibility. Uh, and that's not something you can fake. You've got to earn that over time. And I think we're doing that with, with, with particular brands that are on our platform. I think that lends credence to the viability of what we're doing. And do you have any cities you're targeting kind of up next? Uh, we're taking it. We're, we're again, being conscientious. The, every city that I listed previous, um, you know, if, if we received a, an inbound opportunity in Miami and it makes sense, um, and we'd, we'd acknowledge, okay, what's the, what's the, the climate like in terms of um, restrictions, right, with COVID or anything else that's, that might prohibit or slow us up, but we'll go all day. Um, and, and, but, uh, you know, we're looking at Atlanta, um, you know, uh, all along the coast. So DC, Baltimore, uh, we've got a lot of attention lately in, in Jersey. So just outside of Philly, uh, the Metro, um, as well as some, some opportunities that have popped up on the West coast, um, namely in Oregon pre fires, right? We, you know, there were, there was some movement. Um, so again, it, you know, very strategic about that. Um, but uh, I think we're at a position right now where we're looking at who can provide volume on the platform. If you're a business that can have repeatable volume, meaning you've got work opportunities and we can, we can literally start to forecast based on those needs, we will launch any market. And we're able to do that knowing that we have those opportunities there and the workers will be excited. Does that make sense? I, you know, that's really. Yeah, it's, really, it's, a, it's a two-sided marketplace that's driven by the employers. That's, that's good to know. Um, for us anyway, for us. I mean, and sometimes, you know, if I picked up the phone and called somebody and said, hey, I've got 40,000 workers ready to work for you, you're probably going to hear me out for a minute. Um, and then again, go back to the credibility and the viability of what we're doing for your operation. But either way. No, that sounds good. And so, um, you know, I don't think we've talked about this yet, but talk about the business model of Snapshift. You know, who pays what? How do, how do you guys make money? Yeah, so the model is designed to be transparent for all parties, so the businesses and the workers. Um, on one hand, it's very transactional, just like Uber or Instacart or Lyft, DoorDash. Uh, so we charge only the businesses, right? Um, and it's a flat fee. So rather than, so in the, in the staffing space, it's all about percentages or looking at gig platforms like Uber, it's percentages. And we as consumers never know what truly what the driver or the delivery person is actually getting with us. It's very transparent in that if a business wants to pay $30 an hour, the worker's getting $30 an hour. We're not applying any surcharge like, Hey, we're not going to tack on 30% on top of that or whatever, whatever. We, uh, we have a simple booking fee structure. So if the shift is worked successfully, they pay a flat fee. And so they'll get a receipt just like any of the, you know, gig economy apps it has a line item, booking fee, snap shift, boom. Uh, at the end of the day, when you start to benchmark the total expenditure on our platform, we actually come in neutral or just a little bit less than temp agencies because they're marking up the rates over 100%. And those, these poor workers, I mean, uh, so again, just looking at Midwest, you can look at the East Coast as well. You're looking at 22 to $25 an hour charged. <laughs> the workers are getting eight to 12. And that's, that's just, there's, there's a lot wrong with that. And so, you know, workers on our platform are actually making 50% more on average than the industry rates. And that's actually excluding tips. So forget about any tip rolls or, you know, whatever that may be. Um, they're earning 50% more and they're getting paid near instantly by snap shift. So, you know, as quick as 30 minutes after the, after they clock out of their shift. Um, and again, there, there, there's no cost for the workers. That's fantastic. So that probably also adds, do you have kind of a worker loyalty? They'd probably take a shift from you over another temp agency. Or, do they, they tend to work with you guys exclusively. How does that work? I, you know, we're, again, it's a, we're pretty frictionless. Um, we don't mind. I mean, I, you know, this was an eye opener for us early on, you know, we were trying striving as one of our goals, right? One of our, our focal points was let's make it exclusive. They have to be snap shift only because that's, but at the end of the day, it's, that's not what we need. You know, we started to learn that, you know, you've got hustlers that are, that are dry, delivering for DoorDash and Postmates while driving for Uber and doing some Instacart deliveries. Like, 
that that is the the world that we live in right now, not just in the U.S. If you've got uh, a skill set or uh, the means to do a job, there's no reason you can't do one for us, do one for the next, do one for the next. I think, though, when you look at hospitality opportunities, you know, uh, and the way we take care of and protect, yeah, we hold them accountable, but we protect these these workers, again, from no bias, no discrimination. It's not tolerated. Uh, quick pay. They get access to benefits uh, through some partnerships. You know, we've got partnerships with Chime Bank, which that's the darling right now. They're, they're worth, what, $15 billion, $16 billion. So to have that relationship is pretty cool. Uh, we've also got relationships with, um, uh, you know, some companies in, in Boston that uh, are able to provide retirement. So literal retirement. So uh, 90% of these workers don't have employer-sponsored health care. So there, there's a fear element. Yeah, let's get back to work, but I don't want to die or get sick or, or transfer this sickness to someone I love or care about. So because we don't have insurance or the deductible is $5,000. Like it's, it's just a, it's a lose-lose situation for them. So we allow them to get access through the marketplace, through our partners to get health insurance, dental, vision, 401k, uh, telemedicine. And it's just, and, and that's just the beginning, right? Uh, there's a lot to unpack here with when it comes to worker protections and really making, holding them up on the pedestal that they deserve. Um, but yes, I, I know I got kind of, off topic there. So yes, the repeatability workers, uh, we just have one the other day that we hadn't seen on our platform in 18 months. He's back. And he was so excited. He was off the platform because he moved. You know, we've got people that moved to cities that we're not in. And so as soon as they came back to Indy or got into Denver or Chicago or Nashville, they were, they were back on the app. And, and that's how it should be that they had a good experience. Uh, they'll be back. And that's really nice. That's good to hear. So, um, you know, as we come towards the, you know, the, the back half of this interview, and if any uh, investors have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, but, you know, talk to me a little bit about, you know, you know, what are the kind of unique accomplishments and milestones you, you, you've, you've done so far with the company over the last couple of years? All right, Rob, bear with me because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off the humble hat because I am you know, I'm learning to be proud of these things, you yeah, know, brag, and, brag to us a little bit. These are potential <laughs> investors. Why, why talk to us about why, why we should, should, you know, get involved. All right. Well, so fundraising, doing the, the tech startup uh, life in the Midwest is a little bit tougher than the, than the coast. And so we're, I'm personally very proud that uh, we were selected by 500 startups, you know, their flagship accelerator out of, I don't know, 21, 2200, global startups they only picked 14 so we're one of those um you know they're leading the way the key thing for us what they support teams that have female and and underrepresented founders and so that spoke to us they have 19 unicorns 200 centaurs which are companies that are valued north of 100 million but less than a billion we want to be in those ranks and so for them to to pick us we're very proud about that. And we have to remind ourselves from time to time that that's a big deal. We also got into Generator, uh, which is a top ranked accelerator before 500. But then we also got into Capital Innovators, which is another top ranked accelerator. And we were a finalist for Techstars. So the point being is that that was a little bit of validation that made us very proud. And that was early. This was all, you know, uh, at the end of 2018, beginning of 19. Um, but then, uh, you know, I'd say, in the last 12 months, we were picked as a top 15 startup of the year. Uh, we were TechCrunch's um, uh, top pick for social impact last year, uh, which was pretty cool. SoGal Ventures, uh, you know, we were, uh, as a company, one of 60 global uh, startups that were top startups for them um, with a female or underrepresented founder. Um, so I am very proud that we've been able to achieve these things. Raising VC, right? Only, what is it? less than 1%, I think it's like 0.5, 0 0.05% ever raise VC dollars. So we're in that category. So it's like, all right, of the 1,000 or 2,000, however many companies in the US, we're one of those. Um, but they're just all validation points for us. I mean, you know, and like I said, we need to remind ourselves that we've achieved a lot with a very little, um, you know, and I mean that by our team size. We're not a team of 50 going after no, it's a really a team of three. So 
that's why we maybe feel a little bravado when it comes to this Pepsi challenge that I was talking about. That's fantastic. And as you, as you look, you know, in the, in the kind of months and years ahead, one, you know, what do you see as, you know, kind of the, and within, you know, these things always get very speculative, right? But what do you see as the, you know, the big major milestones you're working towards over the next couple of years? Um, and then, you know, I, I'll start with that question. I'll ask one more follow-up. Well, I'm going to wrap our milestones in into what we see, like in terms of the industry that we're serving. So in the short term, you know, uh, we're very confident that there's going to be that continued evolution towards tech-enabled management of staffing, scheduling, you know, labor in general. Uh, it becomes essential in order for these companies to compete. Um, McKinsey just put out their report that said 71%, now this is across the board, 71% of executives stated that um, adopting labor uh, or a labor model that leverages freelancers and the gig economy is a priority for them. So here we are. Um, I don't think I, that's a, a definite silver lining to what's going on. In the intermediate and longer term, we do see more of a reliance on technology. So taking it a step further, it becomes uh, all about the trust factor. So you think about letting our system make the decision for you. Uh, so you don't have to worry your, your mind about who's coming in or how many you need, things like that, which are some things that we're working towards, you know, kind of that predictive angle, um, you know, but the, uh, if you think of gig economy as it sits, that, that was phase one, we're now in phase two, which is more the gig trade. So I had mentioned, you know, uh, upskilling or, or leveraging your various skill sets, right? And that's something that's going to be more ubiquitous as opposed to I'm just on, I'm just an Uber driver, right? You're going to see it where people are going to learn new skills and then jump onto new platforms, whether it's Fiverr, Upship, or uh, um, Upwork, uh, Winolo, Snapshift, things like that. Um, there is a sobering prediction that's going to drive more, you know, and continued adoption of our platform. We believe that up to 250,000 food and beverage operations will be dead uh, in the next 12 months if there aren't some serious changes. One being the Restaurant Act, right, which was they should have been included uh, as far as that stimulus. Um, but when you have upwards of 6 million people that are vacating the industry, that's a big void. And so now the talent pool for the remaining 700, 800,000 operations is that much smaller. So having uh, an ability to augment your staff, optimize your staff is going to be, uh, that, that's going to be like the golden goose, right? That, that's how companies are going to survive. That makes sense. And then, you know, as you think about you know, the long term for Snapshift, again, this is gets pretty speculative, but what do you think of as potential exit opportunities for Snapshift? Or are you not thinking that far ahead yet? Uh, you know, I'm, yes, we think about it. Uh, it. It's something that, you know, anytime I see a, a company that operates close to our space that raises a substantial amount of money, it's like, it's not that, hey, come buy us. It's, you know, do we play well together? Is there a, an angle here to continue to build out the ecosystem? Whatever's going to happen, you, you're going to see a ton of roll-ups. I mean, um, you saw it with dating apps, right? I think they're all owned by the same private equity group, IAC. You know, so you're going to start to see these things happen, some consolidation. Um, you know, at the end of the day, though, uh, I don't, you know, you look at TaskRabbit, you look at some of these lesser known gig platforms that are unicorns or that exited for billions of dollars. You know, they kind of flew under the Uber radar because that's such a big, that's a big shadow, right, that they cast. But there's tons of operations that have seen some meaningful exits. And that's not always what you think it's going to be. Ikea acquired TaskRabbit. Well, that's because over 40% of all tasks were putting together Ikea furniture. We didn't. That's, that's inside knowledge. That's great. But it was a good leverage point, right? So we'll get to that. You know, um, right now it's just, it's literally heads down. Um, you know, it's get to our immediate goals. Uh, you know, honor our North Star and, and keep executing because that'll all fall into place. But we, we are eyeing big things. We're not trying to be a, you know, a team of three, um, you know, much longer. Uh, that makes sense. And yeah, keep <laughs> keeping your eye on the North Star, you know, keep your head down, get work done and good things tend to happen. Um, well, 
you know, we're, that's, you know, we're coming to the end of, of the prepared questions here. Is there anything else you'd like to leave kind of either anyone who's watching live or anyone watching the recording, anything else you want them to know uh, before we wrap up? Yes. I, I, as I was thinking about it, you know, you asked about milestones and things we were proud of. There is one key piece that we're very proud of. Yes. Fulfillment is awesome, but we started to really uncover the impact that we were having on the workers. These are an overlooked portion of our society. And, and here's some stats. I wanna, I wanna just read these out because it's important. So on our platform, 50% are minority, 60% uh, are female. Uh, I mentioned two thirds are, we're holding down multiple jobs, right? So that becomes a, a, a logical play to use us. 70% are underbanked, meaning they don't have a bank account. They're using prepaid debit cards. Well, in order to use Snapship and get paid fast, you have to have a bank, you know, something that we can deposit the money to, uh, to get it, the, the quick pay. So that's where Chime comes in. But 80% uh, when we polled are deeply concerned about their health. Uh, just because, yeah, you can do all that you can, wear your mask, sanitize, wash your hands, but is the next person and is that business adhering to things? So eliminating that fear factor is something that we just instituted with our COVID safe program. So businesses and workers declare their, their hygiene, their, their health, their adherence. And this is before each interaction on the platform and you get a nice little badge and, and I'm happy to maybe, um, should I send that link to you? Something you can drop in the, the comments there. Um, you know, ultimately I, we, we're very proud of that. That's something we've been working towards. Um, but lastly, you know, adding to that 90% of these people don't have employer sponsored insurance, like I said, so, you know, giving, giving them peace of mind, eliminating the fear, but here's the thing I wanted to read to you guys. Uh, it is important. So let me pull it up. This was a review that we got on the 26th. Didn't see it coming. It's from a worker. I love this app. In all honesty, I would have lost my home if it wasn't for Snapshift. The work environments are usually, if not always great, and the pay always fair and promptly paid, five stars. And I bring this up because it's touching uh, on so many way, levels. And it's humbling and I'm not getting emotional. Uh, there's just something in my eye, but to think that you, we can have that sort of impact at the level that we are, we're really you know, fathoming what it can be at, at scale, so. I'll leave you with that. And should I put the link in, uh, Rob, for the COVID? Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you send it over to me? I'll make sure it gets put placed a couple places, uh, including in, in the uh, description of the video. Um, and and Thor, I think that's a, a great place to leave it. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to kind of chat with us and teach us a little bit more about SnapShift. Uh, we really appreciate it. No, hey, my pleasure. Thanks, everybody. And for everyone watching, thanks uh, for tuning in. For anyone watching the recording and for anyone watching live, Snapshift is currently raising capital on Net Capital. Uh, you can go there and anyone uh, can invest in Snapshift for as little as $100. Um, so with that, Join us. again, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Again.